where I'm going to consider multiple systems with the Kepler and Coro satellites. So the first question here is, well, these satellites do time series photometry, so what, why is that relevant? And the obvious answer is eclipses and ellipsoidal and reflection effects as well. So most of this talk is actually going to be about eclipsing binaries and that kind of thing. So I want to give you um, just a, a very brief history of this. And in fact, it's a, a very mature field. And the, the eclipse hypothesis was proposed for Algol by John Goodrick back in the um, late 1700s. Um, and it was over a century ago that the first eclipsing binary had its mass and radius measured directly from a light curve and from radio velocity observations. So this is actually a very mature field. Now, this continued on quite happily for, um, for pretty much a century, until, of course, it got hit by the space revolution. And I can trace this back as far as 2006, um, for the first real high-quality light curve of an eclipsing binary star. And this one was actually Psi Sen, um, which Hans Bunt and I managed to do with the NASA WIRE satellite. And most of you will not have heard of that, because it's an infrared space mission which went up and promptly broke. But they were able to use a star tracker to do uh, some work, um, work on very bright stars. And this one itself, uh, despite being magnitude four, was not even known to be binary, let alone eclipsing, until we accidentally got a light curve. We, we didn't even select it as a target. It was just picked automatically as a comparison star by the onboard software. So we managed this again with Beta Origi. This was the same one which um, Joel Stebbins um, observed here. So it is therefore the first eclipse binary which had a good mass and radius measurement. Now, we have become um, spoiled, I think, in the last um, five or six years or so by the ridiculous quality of Kepler and Coro light curves. It's worth remembering that uh, seven years ago, this light curve was so good that it made the front cover of A&A. This shows just how far we've come in less than a decade. So, of course, these are just one or two systems. And then Coro and Kepler came along, and suddenly there's a lot more. Now, an important point here is, if you have a survey for transiting planets, you are going to find eclipsing binary stars as well. Because planet transits are a percent deep, a two percent at most. Um, binary eclipses are usually, say, half, well, often half magnitude, up to 0.7 magnitudes in, um, in the normal cases. But weirdos can go up to four or five magnitudes deep. So these are really, really easy things to find. And of course, Coro and Kepler contributed by producing lots and lots of these things. So the first industrial scale um, uh, uh, surveys of eclipsing binaries. And I think we are still lacking um, sufficient manpower to properly deal with these data. Anyway, so this is an Astro Seismology Conference. So I'm going to give you my standard slide of how do we do, deal with an eclipsing binary. Um, so, and I usually use my, my favorite system for my PhD, which is WW Origi, a standard A-type eclipsing binary star with a period of two and a half days. So you need two types of data. The first, of course, is a light, nice light curve. Here we have one. And that gives you the radii of the stars. But it doesn't give you the absolute values, only relative to the orbital semi-major axis. We call that the fractal radii. It also gives you the orbital inclination and some idea of the shape parameter of the orbit. That's eccentricity times the cosine of the argument of periaston, e cos omega. Now, that tells you when the secondary eclipse occurs relative to the primary. So it's generally very well determined for a given light curve. So second piece of information we need is spectroscopic observations to measure radio velocities of both stars. It's important it's both stars. And this gives you the masses of these stars modulo the orbital inclination and also the, the um, semi-major axis modulo inclination and E sine omega. So now if you look at these, you, can, you realize that we have everything here we need to measure mass and radius directly. And in fact, we can do that with good data to a percent or better. And I want to emphasize this is an empirical measurement. You can do this using little more than geometry. You don't need theoretical models at all, if you, um, depending on the system. So these are fundamental cornerstones of stellar physics. And of course, we get a very good surface gravity. Now, if you can find your way to getting an effective temperature, which as we know is not quite so straightforward, then you know the radii of the stars, so therefore you get luminosity from L equals four pi sigma r squared t to the four. And if you know the apparent magnitudes, you get the absolute magnitudes from luminosity, and that gives you a distance. And if you do it intelligently, you, you get a distance to a couple of percent. So these are systems which are very, very useful. There's one more little piece of uh, spice to help here. Now, at this point, we've had a great pile of spectroscopy to measure radio velocities. We know the surface gravity to very high precision, a hundredth of a dex. 
we know the temperature. Therefore, these are very good systems to do a chemical abundance analysis to get the photospheric elemental abundances of these stars. So now we have two stars with known mass, radius, temperature, luminosity, and chemical composition. So what can we do with this? Well, as I've said already, then we can use this to test theoretical models um, just by, by realizing that these stars will have formed together, so they will have the same age and the same chemical composition. So therefore, they're very good tests of, um, of isochrones from theoretical models. There's other things you can do as well. Uh, of course, we understand planets by measuring them relative to the properties of their host stars. So therefore, if you want to measure a planet radius to 5%, you need to do the same or better to the host star. And how to do that? Well, using theoretical models or using empirical mass radius relation, both of which will be calibrated on eclipsing binary stars. You can also investigate formation scenarios, such as look at dynamical evolution of binary systems, or the, whether or not their, their orbits are circular, whether the rotation is synchronized, and whether the rotational axes are aligned with the orbital axis. This gives some insight on the dynamical evolution and formation mechanisms of stars and multiple systems. And of course, if you've got a pile of eclipsing binaries of known galactic position and known chemical abundances, you can start investigating the chemical evolution of our galaxy. And finally, these things are lovely distance indicators. The example here is from a distance to eclip of eclipsing binaries in a small Magellanic cloud. It's also been done to the large Magellanic cloud and now M31 and M33. So this gives us direct distance estimates to the local group galaxies as well, although you do need quite large telescopes for that. So that is my standard introduction to a binary stars. I'm now going to show what we've achieved with Kepler and with Coro. And my, one of my favorite examples is Kick 8410637. Now this is a, a red giant in an eclipsing binary, which Saskia Hecker published in 2010. It's based just on the data you see here. That's, um, that's Kepler quarter one and quarter zero data. So Q0 is there, Q1 is there. You can see a very nice, light cur a very nice eclipse comes out here, about 10% deep, and lasting 1.6 days. And it's also got very, very short partial phases and a long period of totality. So that also tells you that the secondary star is much smaller than the primary star. But it gets better. If you take the eclipse away and look at the residuals, then this red giant shows stochastic oscillations. So now we have the option of, um, of getting mass and radius of a star, for which we get astro-seismic um, predictions as well. And so in Fanson has indeed followed this up. Uh, Kepler has continued to observe this object. Um, as we now have um, three primary and three secondary eclipses, I think it is. You can see here how the primary eclipse is quite a lot deeper than the secondary, but the secondary is a lot longer than the primary. And that is an indicator that the orbit is quite eccentric. In fact, the secondary eclipse lasts seven or eight days or so. Um, Anyway, it's in a 400-day period orbit. It took a while, but we managed to get ground-based spectroscopy, measured the masses and radii, and we're currently in the process of understanding whether these stochastic oscillations give us masses and radii of this star, which fit what we've measured from its eclipses. Um, current suggestions are that it's, we don't quite agree, but work is ongoing. Now, there's more of these systems. Galma exam uh, et al. have discovered a pile more, and they also pointed out that if you look at the, really sh the relatively short period ones, which with these is less than 100 days or so, then you will find that they do not show stochastic oscillations at the level shown by other ones. Now, this appears to be that when you're in a shorter period orbit, the tidal effects induce activity on the giant, which damps out the solar-like oscillations. And now this leads us on to another important point, which is the concept of tidally-induced oscillations. So tidal effects and binaries can damp out stochastic oscillations, but they will cause other things um, other pulsations to appear. And the best example of this is HD 174884, which is done by Coro back in 2007 and 8. Um, now here you can see a very nice primary eclipse here. The eagle-eyed among you might see a secondary eclipse, which is up there. Now this thing is only a couple of percent deep. It's really, really shallow. It's so shallow it's like um, just a deep transiting planet, in fact. So Coro found, found this, um, this object. Carlo did a, a very nice analysis of it. And she discovered that there are tidally induced oscillations occurring at 2, 3, 4, 8, and 13 times the orbital frequency. So this is the first clear evidence for tidally induced pulsations in a binary star system. Right, I'll now move on to um, further examples. The so next thing is to look at very low mass stars. And here we have a rather interesting triple system 
composed of a, of a slightly evolved G-star um, orbited by an eclipsing binary, which itself contains two late M-dwarfs. Um, you see the in and out of periods there. Now, this is in, important because we suddenly are in a region where dynamical effects become useful. You can see from the light curve on the right that these eclipses are rather odd things. Sometimes they occur separately, sometimes they're superimposed, and this is because of the, um, the, the motion of the short period binary as these stars are, are in themselves eclipsing the, um, the G star. And if you build the correct model and analyze this, and this gives you a lot of dynamical information on the nature of this system, and you can measure the masses and radii to a percent or so, even if you can't detect radio velocities of the, um, of the M dwarfs. This was done with a, a spectroscopic orbit of the G dwarf, but then just with dynamical effects from the Kepler light curve. And this is interesting because we don't really understand the properties of low mass stars. And to illustrate this, I'm going to take another uh, uh, figure from the same paper by Carter. Um, here we see mass versus radius for a set of well understood eclipsing binary stars. You see the points up here compared to theoretical models where you see the lines further down. And you can see, of course, that they, they don't agree. Low mass stars currently are not correctly predicted by theoretical models. The radii are too large and the temperatures are too low. Now, it seems quite likely that the solution here is that uh, the, the eclipsing binaries we look at tend to be short period, which means there's tidal effects, so the stars rotate more quickly. This gives enhanced magnetic activity, which inhibits convection, and therefore the radii get larger and the temperatures get smaller. And of course, the solution there is to study longer period systems where tidal effects are weak or negligible. And preliminary results from a couple of papers last year suggest that this indeed does provide um, a good answer to the problem. But it, this discrepancy still isn't properly sorted out. So, moving on again to pre-main sequence stars. Um, these are subject of some interest, and Constance Vince talked on Tuesday about this. And here's a very good example from Coro which is a, a member of an open cluster, you can quite clearly see there's some nice eclipses and there's some, some rubbish going on outside the eclipse as well, which is due to potentially circumbinary material. Now, Ed Gillen will talk about this um, uh, in a couple of talks, so I'll leave the, the gory details to him. So, on next to Delta Scuti stars. Now, this is one of my favorite systems, uh, KIC 1066-1783. And you can see here is a very nice set of uh, eclipses. So we have deep ones and shallow ones. And in between, there's all sorts of crap going on. Now, this turns out to be a G star, which is a um, quite evolved subgiant, and is filling a Roche lobe and transferring material onto an A dwarf, which is, which is detached from its Roche lobe, and is showing a large number of delta scuti um, pulsation frequencies. So if you take these away, then you get the, um, the plot further down, where you can see there's a very nice prime eclipse with a, with a curved base, which means limb darkening and very nice secondary eclipse with a flat base, which means that's an occultation. Um, and this it fitted very well by um, a model of a semi-detached eclipsing binary. So it's a classical algol type system. And that was all fine. Holger Lemon did the honors and uh, got a, a power spectroscopy of this system, measured the masses and radii, and suddenly now we can't fit the light curve anymore. The mass ratio requires it to be a detached binary, which doesn't make any sense because the secondary star is 0.2 solar masses and one solar radii. It's clearly evolved in a very weird way. It's got to be via mass transfer. And in Algol systems, that is meant to continue at a slow rate for potentially giga years. But this one is not doing so. It's managed to detach itself from its row slope. So this is an object which needs more looking at. Of course, I, I want an example from Coro as well. This is um, a nice one, again, quite detached. Masses and radii from the Coro light curve and from ground-based spectroscopy. And in this case, the silver tower required Doppler beaming to fit their light curve. This is because the, um, this maximum is slightly different height to that maximum. Um, and this, uh, this is caused by the relativ relativistic effect of Doppler beaming, which causes the, the star coming towards you to appear to be slightly enhanced in flux. And that is useful because it tells you something about the masses of the stars as well. Now, of course, whenever we have a delta scuti star, we, we can have a gamma door as well. And here's the, the standard Kepler example of um, kick telephone number. Now, Jonas de Bosch was able to, um, to extract a pile of, um, of pulsation frequencies from this object, and he found there was amplitude variability. So this is an interesting system where we're starting to do astroseismology on a star in an eclipsing binary with mass and radius known to 1%. And Coro has done similar, again, Carla Massaroni. Um, she found this one, mass is the radii to percent again, 
and she's able to constrain that the pulsations are consistent with L equals one gravity modes. Now we leave the eclipses behind and move on back to tidally induced oscillations. And here is another an, an object we should not have expected before Kepler went up, Koi 54, the prototype of the heartbeat stars. Now here we have um, a relatively long period binary, 42 days, with a high orbital eccentricity. So the stars spend a lot of time a long way away from each other, but when they come in closely, they, near periastron, they get very close to each other. So you get this increase in brightness due to the reflection and ellipsoidal effects. And you also see, for some reason, two strong pulsations at exactly 90 and 91 times the orbital frequency. Why 90 and 91? Well, actually, if you look closely, there's um, pulsations stretching from 70 up to 100 times the orbital frequency, but 90 and 91 are highly excited. So, Kelly Hamilton will be talking on this later, so I'll, I'll leave the, uh, again the, the details to her. So, on to our next slide. A lot of us here are much, in, much more interested in stochastic oscillations, and my default example here is V380 sig, which is another well-known eclipsing binary, which happened to be in a Kepler field. Um, and it took quite a lot of effort to observe this one, because if you look, it's magnitude 5.8. This thing took a lot of pixels to observe. However, you see here a nice light curve of uh, two sets of eclipses. It's eccentric, but there's all sorts of nasty rubbish going on outside the eclipses. Um, these are early B-type stars, and this turns out to be stochastic oscillations. And here we, we are detecting granulation in a, a B0 giant star. Now, a lot of us want, here want to do this to F and G dwarfs, because that is where we're interested in the, the planet host stars. Now, that is not so straightforward, because the kind of binaries we look at have generally been the shorter period ones, where tidal effects wash out the astroseismic signal. And that is an area which we will need to um, visit more closely um, in future. I'm not aware of, um, of an object with a Kepler-like curve where we can do this. But I, um, I, I put a pile in for the extended mission, but unfortunately we know what happened there. So, on to uh, circumbinary planets. Another triple system here. This is Kepler-16, an eclipsing binary hosting a, a transiting circumbinary planet. So you'll see here eclipses of the prime of the hot star in front of the behind this, the cool star, then of the cool star behind the hot star, and then repeated. So to, but there's extra things going on here and here, and you can see them here and here as well. And you can decompose that into four different types of eclipse. This one here is a hot star being eclipsed by the cool star, then cool star behind hot star, and then here we have a planet in front of the hot star and a planet in front of the cool star. And where it gets particularly exciting here is that these binaries, binary stars are going like this, and the planet is passing slowly in front or behind them, and so you get, very, the, you get transit time variations due to exactly where the binary star is when the planet passes in front of it. But you also get very large duration variations, which gives you the relative velocity of the star which is eclipsed by the planet. So this is an, a large amount of dy dynamical information on the system, and yeah, give you really, really good mass, um, estimates of the masses and radii of these stars. And again, this is a direct empirical measurement. So uh, now we're on to the slide saying none of the above. And uh, one of Martin Still's favorites, I'm sure, is V344 Lyrae, which is a cataclysmic variable. Now, for those who don't know, this is um, a late type um, star, usually an M dwarf, which is um, filling its rose slope and losing mass through an accretion disk onto a white dwarf. They're interesting and very complicated systems. So you see here what happens with a kind of in intermediate period one, an orbital period of, um, I think this one's three and a half hours. So you see outbursts, and these can be quite strong, four or five magnitudes, and then a super outburst, which we don't fully understand still, and then more outbursts. And you can also see this part of the light curve here is reproduced up here, and that part is reproduced over here, and this shows us the orbital period of the system as well. Another one has been done by Gavin Ramsey, who uh, is in the audience today. Y again, you see some really nice outbursts going on. Th this one also shows eclipses, but it's not obvious from the light curve. Um, I wanted to put in a Koro example, and, and AU Mon is the interesting one. Now, here we have a, a BE star, so an emission line, very fast rotating star, with a semi-detached um, G star around it. And there's lots of crap going on outside the eclipses here, which is probably due to a decretion disk coming out from the BE star. And the final example I'm going to show today is KPD 1946, which I think probably was shown back in Aarhus in a, a Cask 4 by Stephen Broman. And here you have um, a sub-dwarf, B-star, eclipsing and being eclipsed by a white dwarf. 
So if you just fit the light curve with eclipses and reflection, you get a reasonable result. If you go down one panel, then adding ellipsoidal variation, it gets better, but still not that good. Adding gravitational lensing, more improvement. But finally, to fit this light curve properly, you need Doppler beaming. And that, as I say, is very helpful in understanding the masses of the stars we're dealing with here. So now I want to have a quick look to the future. Uh, first thing to say is I gave the equivalent talk um, back in Aarhus uh, at the CASC4 workshop in 2010. So whilst I was preparing this talk, I decided that I would look back at my slides and see how well we've done. And I have one piece of good news and one piece of bad news. The good news is that I selected four objects, which I thought were really rather interesting at that time, and all four of those have been studied in detail and published, and several of these have been shown in my talk today. The bad news is that no one has yet um, taken me up on my offer to buy a drink for the first person to get the word photospectrobinary astroseismometry into a paper. The challenge is there. Please accept it. So, we continue to exploit Kepler and Coro. We've really just scratched the surface. Uh, we've picked out the most interesting low-hanging fruit from these missions. There's thousands of eclipsing binary light curves in there. And we, we, we may forget that whilst Kepler observed nearly 200,000 stars, Coro observed 160,000 as well. It, that is still a very large and very interesting database of, um, of, uh, of stars and eclipsing binaries. K2 is funded although it seems from Martin Still's presentations that it's going to be quite difficult to get targets um, accepted for Kepler. So um, you really want to choose your best objects and demonstrate exactly why they're interesting. But looking at the fields coming up there, there certainly are quite a lot of those, especially in the Pleiades and Hyades. Of course, we know from Constance that Bright is now launched, four satellites working in orbit. Now that is going to observe um, a lot of the naked eye brightness objects. And there are many well-known very long, long-studied eclipsing binaries, which are in naked eye brightness, such as Beta Origi and Sai Sen and, and many others. So Bright has a chance of um, doing a lot of good work on this. It, we can look at ones with a full century of observing history. Now, the, the downside is that um, so far the target list only includes a very, very small number of, of eclipsing binary star systems. So far, this is a damp squib, but the target list will get larger and hopefully it will become quite interesting. Of course, what Bright doesn't do will hopefully be done by TESS, and that will be a very, very good source of light curves of some of our, our most favorite objects. And then finally, I want to mention Gaia. Now, compared to the space missions we're talking about most at this conference, the light curves from Gaia will be rubbish, only 70 epochs per object. But that's not its main function. It will provide trigonometric parallaxes, so direct distances, to thousands of binary star systems. Now, of course, from an eclipsing binary, we can measure mass and radius, and if we know its distance, that gives us a direct determination of its effective temperature. So Gaia and eclipsing binaries will allow us to redefine the effective temperature scale. And I know many people in this room have been wanting to do that properly for years. It's a really tricky subject. So, Don will be pleased. It's the final slide. And it's on to Plato. Now, this is where things, to me, get the most interesting. Depending on the observing strategy, we could end up with, um, with up to 10,000 binary star systems. And there are some major advantages over Kepler and Coro. Um, firstly, this is going to be bright stars, like uh, Tess and Bright. So it's going to be easy to follow these things up with small spectroscopic telescopes, such as, um, as Coralie and Hermes. Secondly, all of these stars will be observed at a high cadence. So we'll be able to do astroseismology on anything we see in the field. Compare this to Kepler, of course, when the, the default cadence from almost everything was 1,765 seconds, which is poor. Now, it turns out that I'm in charge of the eclipsing binary work packages for Plato. Um, I say we need to prepare for this. There's a lot of work ahead. We really need to have a good discussion as to how best to exploit the ridiculous amount of data which is going to land on our desks. So if you want to be um, involved, then contact me. Either just come up at coffee or email me here, and I will add you to a list and sooner or later, I will organize a, a working group, and we can discuss these things properly ourselves. The science areas I expect are likely to be massive stars. That's because Plato observes brighter stars than Kepler, so it's going to look at, at uh, more massive objects in general. We also want to look at low-mass stars to really nail down this radius discrepancy. Of course, we want to do pulsating eclipsing binaries, and we want to either do the distance scale or the fundamental effective temperature scale, depending on whether or not Gaia turns out well. 
And I want to finish by reminding you that we ourselves live in the multiple system. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that wide-ranging review. Questions and comments? Enrico. Hi, yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question concerning the uh, regime that you've shown uh, uh, with the stochastic oscillations in an eclipsing binary. Uh, did you try to investigate the astrocytic properties of this star and uh, how uh, that copes with the, what you are able to um, derive from the binary system? Yes, this is work which is ongoing. So Saskia Hecker has um, a student, I believe, working on this. Um, and Dan Huber has done a solution, just a preliminary solution, which is in a, on a review he paper he put on the preprint server. And there he finds that the density and therefore the mass of the red giant is, is wrong by a, something like three sigma, um, based on between the astrocytomic and the eclipse binary results. But uh, we expect detailed analyses in the near future for that. And there are other ones which we're working on as well. Laszlo. All right, this is more like a comment or a question to the Gaia people. Do we understand what kind of biases come from the fact that at micro arc sec level, the Gaia will resolve the, the, the shape of the eclipsing binary? So the photocenter is not a, set, not, not a circle, I mean. Do we understand that the bias is coming from that? Because from 70 epochs, of course, many, many parameters can be fitted. Do we have an answer? John's asking if anyone else would like to answer that. Do I see you making a motion there, Don? No, okay. Right, I'm gonna let you think about that. Uh, uh, Carla has a question. Oh, didn't you? You did. Oh, just as uh, essentially a comment, just to, we have so uh, exceptional light curves, but uh, we have al always to keep in mind that the precision of your masses depends on the spectroscopy. Yes. And that is the bottleneck of all the studies of this type. I mean, that because you need uh, observation that always lasts several nights uh, and it's not easy to get the nights, uh, even uh, there are many uh, medium small size telescopes that are closing. So that really n requires you know, a very good organization. He's doing uh, for Kepler, so, but also for future. This has to be kept in mind. This is, I wanted. Yes, in my experience, that is difficult, but um, these days, it is getting a lot easier to build, say, a one-meter telescope with a spectrograph, and it can be robotic. The, this has been done already. So in 10 years' time, hopefully, there's quite a lot of these. Fingers crossed. So John, Last uh, question. John, John, you mentioned that the tidal effect can suppress the um, oscillation modes in star, and, but induce other oscillations. I'm not sure how that works. Is it because the uh, tidal effect changes the rotation rate, therefore some of the normal modes appear in other frequencies, or, I mean, I, I don't imagine how you can directly influence the excitation, the excitation of the modes. Yes, well, I have to just refer to the paper by Galm here, and he reckons that um, the tidal effects cause surface activity on the giants, which suppress the pulsations in the, um, at the outer edge of the star, so you don't really see them. But um, please look at that paper for your answer. If, if you go set up, Simon. All right, let's thank John once more. Thank you very much. <laughs>